bright golden haze on the meadow. There's a bright golden haze on the meadow. The corn is as high as an elephant's high, and it looks like it's climbing clear up to the sky. Oh, That, as most of you probably know, is from the opening number of the first Rodgers and Hammerstein show, Oklahoma. And that was the moment that began to change the American musical forever. That change was largely due to Oscar Hammerstein II, lyricist, librettist, and producer. His career spanned 40 years from 1920 to 1960s, and his shows also included Showboat, Carousel, South Pacific, The King and I, Cinderella, and The Sound of Music. The Library of Congress is Counts Hammerstein's paper among its treasures, and the recording you heard tonight is from Oscar's Dictabelts. Um, the collection itself includes in the neighborhood of 20 to 30,000 letters. Um, and prescient fellow that Hammerstein was, he kept copies of most of his outgoing correspondence. Tonight's concert is designed to celebrate the man, the collection, and those letters with readings from the letters paired with songs that directly or indirectly relate to them. We want to start tonight with a love song. The image that has evolved of Hammerstein has grown rather sentimental with songs like If I Loved You, Some Enchanted Evening, and Younger Than Springtime. He was clearly a romantic, but Oscar could also be quite passionate. We have proof. Oscar and Dorothy Blanchard Jacobson were both married to other people when they met and fell in love aboard ship in 1927. Oscar divorced first, and in 1929, Dorothy went to Reno, Nevada to divorce her husband so she could marry Oscar. Oscar wrote her letters, several letters, passionate letters. Here are two excerpts. My beautiful self, you and your soul-filling blue eyes and your thick chestnut hair, you and your shoulders that are always passively asking to be kissed as Meadows asked, without asp speaking or moving, for raindrops from a passing cloud. And if your shoulders are Meadows and the raindrops you seek are kisses, then here is a cloud that will never pass, having been sent by nature to hover over you always and shower you with as many osculatory storms as are good for meadows. <laughs> Maybe more than are good for meadows. Come to me in your glory with graceful robes on your fine straight back and your soul that I think the counterpart of my soul shining from your clear blue eyes. Come to me as I've dreamed of you, and I'll warrant I shall be as you have dreamed of me, or long ago of a man you had never met. Come to me that way, and give me my chance to make it worth your while. And the viands, and the fruits, and the spices we enjoy, and the wine of passion which we drink in deep ecstatic draughts will be sweet to us both. And always, I hope, serve to us in dishes and goblets of purest gold. But the highest expression of our union will be those peaceful hours when I hold you in a gentle embrace, silent, contented hours of understanding. I will have my arms around you, and your head will be on my shoulder, and from my eyes, Joyful tears of gratitude to God shall well up and fall down my cheek onto your hair. Okay, now. <laughs> if you're going to have someone write you a love letter, wouldn't you like it to be from Oscar? Um, wanting to pair that with a song, there were many possibilities that came to mind, but there was one that seemed most appropriate, All the Things You Are, with its poetic images and gorgeous yearning melody by Kern. Never can be at ease when I meet him. Never say 
Oscar's first iconic song was Old Man River from Showboat in 1927. In 1937, Oscar's lawyer informed him that a movie studio was planning a film to be titled Old Man River, and at Oscar's behest, he was going to make a thorough investigation of the situation. Dear Oscar, regarding the above matter, I cannot really give you an authoritative opinion as no case has ever been brought to court involving the precise question as to whether one who originates the name of a song can enjoin the making of a picture bearing that name. Turning to the question as to whether the creators of the title Old Man River had created a so-called trade name and that the use of this title in a motion picture would be unfair to the authors as distinguished from the public, I am doubtful if this would be the case, particularly in the case of Old Man River. Creation of a title to a song does not represent a large capital investment, and especially in the case of Old Man River, the expression was an old one, not originated by you, and was merely taken out of public domain for use as the title of a song. <laughs> a clearly piqued Oscar defensively replied, Thank you for your opinion of the situation of the title of Old Man River. Referring to your statement on the last page that the expression was an old one not originated by me and was merely taken out of the public domain for the title of a song, I have to violently disagree with that statement. The expression was originated by me, and if it was an old one and in the public domain, the public seemed blandly unconscious of it until 1926, <laughs> when the song was introduced. I had never heard the expression before, and uh, neither had you. <laughs> but it seems odd that what is now a byword in referring to the Mississippi should never have been used before in newspapers or in common speech. It is such a, a good name for a river that you would think it would have been used if it had been available. <laughs> the aggravated artist speaking, love to all, Oscar. <laughs> Does he care if the world ain't free? Old man a river, that old man a river, he must know something, but 
Speaking of Old Man River, a magazine once asked Oscar's permission to quote a line from the song. His response, You may tell the Nash Air Flight magazine that it is okay to use the words fish gotta swim, birds gotta fly in the context they submitted. You may also inform them that these words are not from Old Man River. <laughs> they are from a song called Can't Help Lovin' That Man. In Old Man River, there is nothing about either swimming or flying. <laughs> it is mostly rolling. This is not to suggest that Oscar was always right. In fact, sometimes he needed correction. After a backer's audition for Carousel, Oscar received a letter from a potential backer. Your lines intrigued me as being really marvelous and in full keeping with what anyone familiar with your excellent, top quality work would expect. In any event, I am writing to suggest if accuracy in your lyrics is desirable, that your staff check the mating habits of sheep. <laughs> I put some sheep in up here when the war broke out and seemingly the females are in heat just once a year. Autumn, and lambs are born only in late winter. By Easter, they are, in the language of the marketplace, spring baby lambs. I do not think rams mate with ewes in June, as they do in your lyrics, <laughs> but I am not certain. <laughs> we have been told to keep our rams separate at all times, except <laughs> when the ewes are in heat, but we did not follow this precaution, and in several years, all mating seemed confided to September to October. No mounting whatsoever in June, or if so, no results. In Oscar's no pun intended sheepish reply, <laughs> I was delighted with the parts of your letter praising my work and thrown into consternation by the unwelcome news about the eccentrically frigid behavior of yous in June. I have since checked your statement and found it to be true. It looks very much as if in the interest of scientific honesty, I shall have to abandon the verse dealing with sheep. Alas, Oscar lied and kept the inaccurate lyric from June is Bustin' Out All Over, a song which also shows that Oscar could be the witty equal of Cole Porter or Lorenz Hart when the situation called for it. Chico. 
because the captain's hanker for a comfort they can only get at port. Because it's June. June, June, June. Just because it's June. June, June. Between you and me, Oscar should have known better. Although he grew up about as much of an urban sophisticate as you can imagine, including having gone to law school at Columbia, he developed a deep love for the country. His Highland farm in Bucks County, Pennsylvania was a real working farm with just about every farmyard animal you can imagine. And even, Oscar even bred Angus cows there. The farm was run by Peter Moen, who seems to have been a charming and earnest fellow. In one letter written from a sickbed, Peter updated Oscar with, I am glad to tell you I got 50 ducks. They came on Sunday, and I could not get out of bed, so they slept in my room. <laughs> Expect to get one more lamb and one more pig, and then the family is complete. The cows, pigs, ducks, chickens, and lambs are all doing fine, and I am proud of them. Except my smallest bull calf developed pneumonia, and for a few days it seemed he was ready to leave this world. One wonders if the farm proved at least a partial inspiration for... <laughs> Chicks and ducks and geese better scurry when I take you out in the surrey. Fringe on top. Would you say the fringe was made of silk? Wouldn't have no other kind but silk. Has it really got a team of small white horses? One's like milk, the other's more like snow. When we hit that road, hell for Cats and dogs all dance in the heather. Birds and frogs all sing all together, and the toads will hop. The wind all whistle as we rattle along. The cows will moo in the clover. The river will ripple out a whispered song and whisper it over and over. Two bright sidelights winking and blinking. Ain't no finer ring, I'm a thinking. You can keep your ring if you're thinking that I care to swap for that shiny little surrey with the fringe on the top. And speaking about chicks and ducks and turkeys, as many of you no doubt know, Oscar is known for having something of a fetish for including bird images in his songs. By my count, at least 50. Here is a medley of some of the best known examples. Thank you. 
is sitting on her eggs and suddenly those eggs have wings and eyes and beaks and legs Given that, you might reasonably expect Oscar had a great love for birds. Well, you'd be wrong. <laughs> As Oscar wrote in one letter, We had a swell time in Florida. For another two days, we went into the Everglades under the auspices of the Audubon Society and studied wildlife. I have learned to identify the roseate spoonbill, the Louisiana heron, the snowy egret, and at some distance I can tell a vulture from an eagle because when they soar, an eagle's wings are flattened out. The vulture's wings form an obverse V. I've also met a bird called the man of war who lived on fish but can't catch them himself, so he gets his food by scaring smaller birds to drop their fish. My two days study only reinforced my theory that birds have been misunderstood for many years. They have been built up by poet and sentimental naturalist to connote gentleness and beauty when, as a matter of fact, they are the most predatory, vicious, and murderous living beings. <laughs> and as for their beauty, they only have it when they are far away, close up, their mean, small, reptilian eyes give them away. I wasn't going to share this next letter for fear of upsetting some of you, but I found I couldn't resist. It is Thanksgiving Day. I am considering the turkey we ate at 2 p.m. It is now 10 p.m., and the fact that I am still considering it is significant. <laughs> Last week, he was one of these singularly unattractive fowls huddled with his friends on their wire perch, gobbling angrily when I approached and turning blue about the head. I stuffed so large a part of him into me today that for a while I was afraid I was turning blue about the head. I didn't dare look in the mirror to check. 
You often hear people say that they could not kill and eat something they had seen grow up on a farm. I can understand this kind of sentimental attitude towards a soft-eyed calf, a playful lamb, or even a pig who has the kind of busybody personality you can't forget. But turkeys were made for man to eat and for no other reason. <laughs> they are silly looking, suspicious, and unheroic birds who take on glory only after they have been cooked, stuffed, and placed on a table. I should, the reason for that letter, it was written to Josh Logan um, after he was institutionalized with a nervous breakdown. So it was really Oscar's attempt to amuse his friend who was in not the best shape. So that's the reason for it. Um, the beginning of World War II found Oscar at a low point in his career. His last real hit had been New Moon in 1928 and a modest success with Music in the Air in 1932. As he wrote to a friend shortly after the opening of the long forgotten Sunny River on December 4th, 1941. Our play is not doing well. The critics struck us a body blow and three days later, the Japanese followed with another. <laughs> Despite that, Oscar became deeply involved with any number of war related projects. He wrote fundraising letters, he wrote for bond drives, he and Dorothy helped create the Stage Door Canteen, he was on the Writer's War Board and chairman of the Writer's War Music Board. But more than anything, well, here it is in his own words. My chief aim has been to write a great song, and this I have failed to do. Although I have devoted nearly all of my time to it for the past three months. Now, I don't mean a song like, Goodbye Mama, I'm Going to Yokohama. I mean an important song. The uh, difficulty of writing an expression of what Americans feel today is a very distressing thing because I find as I try to write it that there is something wrong with the script. We don't all feel the same. We don't all have the same understanding of what are the aims of this war and the spontaneous emotional unity which was achieved by the sudden blow at Pearl Harbor, has now been dissipated into something like the bickering period which existed just before. Roger Delisle did not write the Marseillaise and thereby exhort France to revolt against the king. The spirit of revolution was there and after years of irritation had been deeply embedded in the hearts of all Frenchmen. And as he did, as, uh, and all he did as a poet was to crystallize this unified purpose. I, as a minor poet of Tin Pan Alley, feel the need for such wholehearted unity and clarity of aims. And even then, I might not do as good a job as Delisle. I would like, however, to get into the ring with him sometime as equal weights. As it happens, Oscar did write a great war song, although he wrote it more than a year before the U.S. joined the war just after the Nazis invaded Paris in June of 1940. And it's a song not about war, but what was being lost and might be lost forever. Streets are where 
lest you think that song was quickly forgotten, there was a telegram from Jerome Kern in 1942. Paris won the Academy Award. Congrats. Love, Jerry. <laughs> and the telegram's on display in the lobby, so check it out as you're going. Um, during the course of the war, Oscar began his co collaboration with Richard Rogers that exploded on the scene with Oklahoma that opened in March of 43. In December of that year, he followed with another solo success, his adaptation of Carmen Jones. Um, but despite all his success, the war maintained Oscar's thoughts. Here are excerpts from an exchange with his eldest son, Billy, from December 1944. Billy was in the Navy, a quartermaster on a ship in the Pacific. As it looks now, I may be just in time to catch the last night of Oklahoma's third revival. Our motto, in case I haven't mentioned it, is the Golden Gate by 48, to which even more pessimistic wags have added, and the bread line of 49. Admiral Nimitz's Xmas greetings to the fleet mentions that our increased distance from home at this time is a measure of our success, intimating that the farther from home we get geographically, the closer we get shall we say, historically. How I long to sit at a table covered with damask and shining silver and flowers and finger bowls, to be dressed immaculately in soft linen and feel clean and pure, not to have sweat under my arms and my pants sticking to my legs, to smell a woman's perfume and to engage in an enjoyable conversation devoid of four-letter smutty words which seem to be necessary in verbal expression in the Navy. The, the recent reverses on the European front have been very distressing. The worst part has been listening to the comments of armchair generals. I am sure we will not know the true cause of the surprise and the breakthrough for some time. It does seem that our intelligence was not very accurate concerning German strength, but it is Ridiculous for us to draw any conclusions or blame anyone until we know whom to blame, if indeed anyone is to blame. I do blame, and bitterly, some very heroic and great and prominent generals for making all their grandiose prophecies last August. No one asked them to protect the probable end of the war with Germany, but they did. Then. There is the disappointing goings-on in Greece, Italy, Belgium, and Poland. I am not taking sides. I don't know what factions are right. I can see arguments for both views in each case. Mankind is not of a piece yet. It is a crazy quilt. And all you can do with a crazy quilt is add a patch here and a patch there. The best thing an individual can do is try to land on a color that he likes. Of course, now and then a man comes along with a dye that would make it all one beautiful, solid color. But the people who are in the business of manufacturing patches usually manage to crucify him before he can uncork his magic liquid. With this complex and incomplete comparison, I close with love, Dad. With the war over, The King and I opened in 1951. It was largely written for Gertrude Lawrence, but she died suddenly in 1952. Her understudy, Constance Carpenter, Connie, took over the role. Oscar attended performances of his shows throughout their runs to make sure they remained fresh and bad habits didn't creep in. After attending one performance of The King and I, he wrote a letter to the show's stage manager, which included the following. Please forward my suggestion to Connie that instead of imagining the young lovers being down at about where the horn section is, <laughs> that it would be better if they were out, as if she called out into the night, out into the front. She may answer that she has always been doing this, I don't know, but if she has, I think it's wrong. I think the lovers ought to be somewhere on the first balcony. They are all the young lovers in the world she is really talking to. The song is bigger than that. She makes it small by singing down to the orchestra pit on her left. <laughs> when I think of Tom, I think about the night when the earth smelled of summer. And the soft mist of England was sleeping on a hill. I remember. 
Now, for those of you who are curious about the relationship between Anna and the king, was there romantic love there? Well, someone had the temerity to write Oscar and ask him, and Oscar replied, I think that Anna and the king are really in love with each other as man and woman, but I don't believe that either one of them knows it. Working together as they did and influencing others as much as they did, there has always seemed to me a suggestion of something more than an intellectual and spiritual bond between them. When you put the question bluntly, was he a man with whom she could have or might have gone to bed with? I don't believe she might have, but I believe that she could have had she not been a Victorian, had he not been Oriental, and had all the conditions that surrounded their life together been changed. <laughs> when they dance the polka, they come closest to feeling and showing this desire. P please understand that my answer does not purport to be an accurate and specific one, there is a great deal of room for opinion in this story, and no one will ever be able to prove anything. Oscar was a researcher. He did research himself. His daughter Alice did research for him. And at his request, collaborators provided research. C.Y. Lee, the author of the novel Flower Drum Song, provided much fascinating background material. About Chinese family associations, there are more than two dozen of them. Their most important function is arbitration of dispute. The elders of the family association will get together and discuss the points and make their decision. It's an honor system. The members usually obey their decision. The members' frequent trouble is their picture brides, who often break their agreement after arrival in this country. If a picture bride from Hong Kong refuses to marry the man, the family association will step out and at least try to get the man's money back. They are pretty powerful, those associations. Oscar, the dogged inquirer, solicited the following very specific information from Lee, which would make the song that follows possible. Dear Mr. Hammerstein, I'm very happy to learn that you have already completed three songs. It is wonderful news that everything is sailing so smoothly. Joe says that you want to know something about the flower drum. It is an ancient instrument, but not too different from a bongo. It's about two feet long, with a face the size of a dinner plate. The drum is slung over the shoulder of a pretty girl who beats it with a stick. And here, Lee drew a picture of the flower drum, and the letter with his picture is also on display in the lobby. My father says that children keep growing Rivers keep flowing too. My father says he doesn't know why, but somehow or other they do. They do. Somehow or other they do. A hundred million miracles. A hundred million.
1952, Oscar became an ardent and vocal supporter of Attaway Stevenson for president, as opposed to Eisenhower, who he had previously supported. Some of Hammerstein's friends and fans were not happy about his choice. In fact, one woman wrote, Dear Dick Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein, Last night I witnessed the death of two brilliant men. <laughs> and a little of my heart dies with them. And as I sit here trying to write a fitting obituary, I'm holding back the tears for all the beautiful, beautiful music and lyrics that died with you. I ask myself, why? Why should two men, two men who symbolize in the minds of thousands of people all that is fine and stimulating, that the feeling that only great music can bring, why should you support a form of government whose every action has been corruption, greed, graft? I took no notice of the Hollywood characters that stood beside you on that platform last night. We expect that sort of thing from them. <laughs> Hollywood has long been an unlimited source for commies and trash, as every intelligent American can tell you. Mary Smith. <laughs> On a less incendiary note, an actual friend of Oscar's wrote a letter intended more to convince than scold, to which Oscar responded sagely. I have also read your dissertation on conservatism. It seems to me entirely a question of semantics. Many of the characteristics and virtues that you attribute, attribute to your conservative, I would attribute to what I call a liberal. The older I grow, the more impressed I am with the truth of trite sayings, which by now have been rendered nearly useless because they have been said too much and people have forgotten the literal inspiration of their first launchings. For instance, take the expression, it takes all kinds of people to make up a world. Nobody makes any avowed denial of this statement, but on the other hand, very few really subscribe to it. Most people believe that if it takes all kinds of people to make up a world, a great many of those people should be left in the background. <laughs> many believe that only their kind of people make up a world or are needed to make up a world and the others are superfluous burdens. Now actually, it is very, very true that it takes all kinds of people to make up a world. Not only are the conservative and liberal needed, but the reactionary and the radical too. I have no interest in choosing my own category, and I am quite willing to join all of their clubs and attend their meetings when I feel like it, and vote yay or nay when I feel like it. I prefer to avoid loyalty to any of these crowds, but if one feels the need of attaching oneself to a category, that is all right too, providing he admits the essential necessity of the existence of the others existence. And all this brings us to mind one of Oscar's more obscure songs from the lesser known Pipe Dream. The starfish may look unimportant, lying limply on his underwater shelf. He may look unimportant to you, but he's very interesting to himself. It takes all the kinds of people to make up the world, all the kinds of people and things. They crawl on the earth, they swim in the sea, and they fly through the sky on wings. All the kinds of people and things. And so much of the buzzard. He is something I would never like to be. But who knows what goes on in his mind? He may think he is superior to me. <clears throat> you may not admire armadillos. They're repulsive and they lead peculiar lives. They may not look attractive to you. But they're very 
very interesting to their wives. It takes all the kinds of people to make up a world, all the kinds of people and things. They crawl on the earth, they swim in the sea, and they fly through the sky on a wings. One guy will kill you for dough, and one guy will rob you for lunch. One guy will help you, and he makes you fall in love with the whole damn It would be almost unthinkable to do a Hammerstein concert and not include You've Gotta Be Carefully Taught from South Pacific. Of all of Oscar's songs, it's the most pointed, the one most capable of changing minds or at least provoking thought. And for someone who fought passionately against prejudice of all kinds, it's his clear, clearest argument in song. But there were complaints about Carefully Taught. If you will accept the sincere and earnest opinion of a layman and theater goer, though there is one way in which it can be improved, please eliminate that song by the lieutenant in the last act, which deals with something on the order of they have to be very carefully schooled. It is not necessary to carry the point or message of the play if you insist on having a message in it, and it seems out of place. Now, it gives the audience the same letdown feeling as if the show were abruptly halted for a double barrel, three minute commercial. <laughs> My point is that that particular song weakens not only the show as a whole, but also weakens your message. Up to that point, the question had been dealt with subtly and with good taste. It says nothing when that isn't said in every paper, magazine, or book of fiction and radio broadcasts. The theme is wearing thin. Admittedly, the song ties in with the plot of the story, but it is too blunt. Too much like pure, harsh propaganda. That song is a harangue, presumably for the benefit of the moron who did not get the point from the events in the play. <laughs> ah, but here is Oscar's reasoned reply. Thank you for your letter. I am very happy that you like South Pacific so well, and I am grateful for your interest in suggesting the elimination of You've Got to Be Taught. Please forgive me for not agreeing with you. I am most anxious to make the point not only that prejudice exists and is a problem, but that its birth lies in teaching, and not in the fallacious belief that there are basic biological, physiological, and mental differences between races. I believe I get the point of your letter very clearly, and I realize very well the dangers of overstating the case. But I just feel that the case is not fully stated without this song. I wish it were not true that all these things are accepted by the public. You say the theme is wearing thin. But in spite of this, I see progress being made only very slowly. You've got to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from here to here. It's got to be drunk in your dear little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught to be afraid of people whose eyes are oddly made and people whose skin is a different shade. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight. To hate all the people your relatives hate, you've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be carefully taught.
Oscar's passion and belief was not just theoretical, and his own children were clearly taught well. As he wrote to a friend about his daughter Alice and her husband, About 18 months ago, they did adopt a baby who is half American and half Japanese. Melinda is two years old this Monday, and she is a remarkable child, one of the most alert and brightest and enchanting kids I have ever seen. Of my various grandchildren, adopted, step, and all varieties, there is none I love better than Melinda. Um, I share this next song for two reasons. First, to make the point that Oscar wrote with several composers aside from Kern and Rogers, including Gershwin, Newmans, and Romberg. But this song was composed by the comparatively obscure Harry Ruby. But I'll confess my primary reason for including this song is to give you the opportunity to hear excerpts from two of Ruby's letters. Tonight, at my age, which shall be nameless, I am going to a Halloween party at Groucho's. About 40 of us, all old enough to be somebody's grandfather, will be dressed, that is, in masquerade. I was going to go as a middle-aged Jew, but none of the costume companies have that kind of getup. <laughs> Halloween, while not as sacred as Yom Kippur, is nevertheless a very important Jewish holiday. <laughs> Commemorated the birthday of Maya Halloween, who distinguished himself as a notary public during the Thirty Years' War. <laughs> I ain't quite as busy as I'd like to be, but I do my philosophical best to keep going and feel well. Every time some evil spirit impels me to reach for a bridge to jump off, I find consolation and comfort and the fact that I have all one can ask out of life, except youth, good health, and money. <laughs> In the last decade of Oscar's life, he was deeply involved with several social issues. Racial inequality and treatment was a particular focus. He was on the board of the NAACP. But after the World War II, more than anything, he focused on how to stop another war, particularly now that another world war would likely be a nuclear war, with its, potential devastating, with its potential of devastating much of the Earth. Toward that end, he was on the Writers' War Board for World Government and on the board of the United World Federalists. He made speeches, did fundraising, cajoled and wrangled, and wrote articles and letters. Today, our title to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is heavily mortgaged. Foreclosure can come without notice with the dropping of one bomb in the right place, and it doesn't have to fall right on your head either. It can miss you by 20 miles and still kill you. Now you would think that all men and women in the world would be uniting to defend themselves against this condition. You would think they would be applying all their energies and ingenuities to conceiving ways to stop it. You would think they might be debating fiercely among themselves over the virtues of rival schemes to prevent war forever. But no, this is not happening at all. There are no rival schemes for permanent world peace. There is only one idea that I know of which aims so high. That is the idea of law against war. Law to be administered and enforced by some kind of limited world government. A great many people do not like the idea of our nation giving up even that limited portion of its sovereignty. I don't like it either. I don't like world government. What am I doing here? Why did I come to tell you that I don't like world government? I don't like it. And at the same time, to advocate it as a way to get permanent world peace. Not the best way, the only way. If someone will tell me of an easier way, I will drop world government like a shot and go along with him. But so far, I haven't heard one suggestion that even purports to seek permanent world peace. Given all this, I tried to think what Hammerstein song to tie it with. Um, the United World Federalists actually asked Oscar to write a song, but he demurred saying such things don't work that way. But I think he did write one song that both expressed his frustration with the aforementioned apathy. 
I also think it was his subtle way of changing minds for, by giving voice to the app, Pathetic, he paints them in a way that would likely give audience members reason to question their own apathy, perhaps even shaming them into action. So here's no way to stop it from the sound of music. In the song, Elsa and Max are trying to convince Captain Von Trapp that there's no way to stop the Nazis from overturning Austria, so he might as well make them think he's on their side. discuss the nitty-gritty of collaboration are fairly rare. After all, the people who are collaborating are usual working together in close proximity. But in November 1956, Oscar and Dorothy were vacationing in Australia when, while Oscar was still working on the lyrics for Cinderella. As a result, we have this exchange between Rogers and Hammerstein. I have been brooding about a line in Do I Love You Because You're Beautiful. I don't like Am I Making Believe, etc. Making Believe. Outside of the fact that I cashed in on that phrase some years ago, <laughs> seems an unimportant expression in this connection. How about this? Am I telling my heart I see in you a girl too lovely to be really true? Let me know what you think. The last time we went over this number, I suggested that you stay up on the higher notes going into the phrase, are you the sweet invention, etc. First, you said you had wanted to finish in minor, then you said, that you could do what I was asking for and still finish in minor. Now, I have a new idea. Would it not be more exciting and psychologically sounder to finish the refrain in major, even though you started it in minor? It is my conception that although the last line is a question, the lover actually believes that she is as beautiful as she seems. So, after starting with doubt, 
the minor key, the major finish would imply, oh hell, I love you and I really think in my heart of hearts you are as beautiful as you seem. This is based, of course, on the assumption that it is not musically ungrammatical to start with minor and finish with major. I have no particular qualms about using the line, am I making believe, etc. It occurs to me that this is simply a part of the language and it is not connected with you any more than it is with dozens of other authors. I am not devoted to the line, a girl too lovely to be really true, for the simple reason I am not devoted to splitting infinitives. <laughs> there is absolutely nothing ungrammatical about ending in major when you start in minor. It is quite conventional and extraordinarily effective. My reason for wanting to change make-believe was not chiefly because of my earlier use of the phrase. I, I think it is a little phrase, and I think telling my heart has more emotional importance. I don't share your split infinitive phobia, but I, I tried very hard to dodge really and couldn't get out of it. As I said in my last communication, once you and I sit down in a room and discuss those matters of syllables and notes, there isn't the remotest possibility of disagreement. Hammerstein passed away in his home at Highland Farm on August 23, 1960. He was 65. On September 16th, his doctor, Ben Kern, wrote this to Dorothy Hammerstein. Dear Dorothy, I have delayed writing because it is so difficult to say what one feels. In almost 25 years of medicine, I have not seen anyone handled so difficult a personal situation so well as you. At one of his last visits to my office, I told Oscar, despite all other recommendations to the contrary, I would suggest that he take a course of x-ray therapy. The next day, he came back with these words. Ben, I have considered very carefully your recommendation. In this showdown, I must really decide whether to die, possibly a little later in the hospital, or on Dorothy's pillow. 
I'm really lucky and never knew how much until now. And Dorothy wrote back. Dear Ben, thank you very much for your kind letter. It was not difficult, really, to behave well under the recent circumstances. Oscar and I had a wonderful 31 years together with very few sour notes. And there are no regrets for what might have been, and he left us all with emotional strength and balance. This is how things seem now, and I think it will last. He was too young, too good, and most undeserving of his illness. But he told me that we have so much to be grateful for, that to whine and cry would be pure greediness. Thank you for your understand and care of our darling Oscar. Sincerely always, Dorothy. Hammerstein's music publisher once wrote him a letter asking if, through the years, wasn't there a favorite song of yours which for some reason or other never became popular that he might promote? Oscar wrote back that it was the song The Folks Who Live on the Hill. This seems the fitting song to sum up Oscar's marriage and Oscar's home and his philosophy. <laughs> We struggled to decide on a final song for tonight's concert. We decided on one of the better known ones, an anthem of sorts, but for context, as Oscar explained it to a fan. We are happy that you liked our song, You'll Never Walk Alone. 
It was written to fit, fit a situation and characters in a play called Carousel. It is sung in the last scene of this play at school exercises in a small town in New England. And its application to the story is that it effectively encourages a young child who is discouraged and disheartened. The spirit of her father, who has died several years before, appears behind her and urges her to listen to the words of this simple school song and understand what they mean, and especially what they mean to her. So that's our final message. Listen to the words of any song by Oscar Hammerstein, understand what they mean, and especially what they mean to you.